this man spoke, I'm going to miss this mountain. Truly a mountaintop experience, getting to a, a, a preacher's dream of a lifetime to expound this text uh, in nearly 30 years of uh, regular preaching. It's one of the finest feasts for my soul. Thank you, church family, for the privilege of getting to do this. Uh, it's an unspeakable honor. And uh, a sermon that began so positively ends very severely. If you remember Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount began with beatitudes of blessing, and it ends with cursings and warnings. Perhaps the Lord knows that we need, if you remember the Old Testament image, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. The Israelites needed not only to hear the blessings pronounced, but also the warnings. And we come to the end of the end now, as Jesus concludes his conclusion. Remember, he began back in Matthew 7 from verse 13, climaxing now in verses 24 through the end. The last in a series of stark contrasts, if you'll recall, from the two gates and the two roads. We then saw the two trees. And then last time, the two groups, some genuinely saying, Lord, Lord, and others falsely so. And now he turns to two houses and two builders, as I said in the first service, when there's more children uh, who weren't yet in Sunday school hour during this hour, but I'm glad there's still some children with us. This is a great one for pictures and taking notes from Pastor Tim's sermon, and I would love to see what you have learned and drawn from this famous story and parable, as it were, an illustration Jesus gives. In the days of the Great Awakening and leading up to it in the 1700s in North America, it's, we were, were told that the churches had a deadness and a formality that reigned everywhere. Exactly what Jesus is confronting here in his Sermon on the Mount. A historian of that time period in the American colonies writes, never perhaps had the expectation of reaching heaven at last been more general or more confident. Sounds like our day and age, doesn't it? Everybody, you remember the song, right? Everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. I mean, nowadays, have you ever been to a funeral or ever heard of a reference to someone who died without immediate certainty? Oh, they're in a better place. Oh, their soul rests in peace. Today, everyone believes in a kind of uh, false doctrine, a heresy of uh, a kind of universalism, basically justification by death alone. All you got to do to get to heaven is die. Exactly what Matthew 7 warns against, the terrifying reality of hypocrisy and self-deception. Do you know the two most influential sermons ever in the United States, in all of American history, coming out of both of them, the Great Awakening, Neither of them feel good, <laughs> therapeutic, or particularly uh, inspiring sermons at first. First was to the general congregations, Jonathan Edwards, you know it, sinners in the hands of an angry God. But do you know the second most influential sermon? Gilbert Tennant, around the same time, he preached particularly warning preachers, a sermon, and it got him in hot water with his denomination for years to come but also led to many conversions. It was a bold, a forceful message. The title tells you that already. The danger of an unconverted ministry. In the sermon, Tennant said such, he, he, he shocked people with statements like this. I'm truly persuaded that most preachers talk of an unknown and an unfelt Christ. And the reason why congregations have been so dead is because they have dead men preaching to them. But I want to add a disclaimer that I've wanted to find the right spot for the last few weeks going through our Lord's stern and severe conclusion to Matthew 7. Spending too long in a passage like this does run a small risk for true believers with very tender consciences. A few might be paralyzed by introspection, by excessive and unbiblical fears about not being saved. And God's word guarantees that Jesus would not do that. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench. 
Please hear me. Matthew 7 is not given to wound true believers. It's given to warn false believers. We want that to be very clear. However, this danger of discouraging a weaker child of God is a risk faithful preachers must run and pastors must face up to because the message of Scripture demands it in texts like this. Self-examination for true converts only confirms their faith. It cannot destroy it. But self-examination for false converts is the only way to salvation. The only hope for a pretend believer to actually repent and be rescued from everlasting destruction is warnings like this. God forbid that unsaved churchgoers would point to preachers like me or Christians like you on judgment day and say, you never told me. Why didn't you warn? Your preaching was all comfort and no caution. Why didn't you tell me the way was so, the gate was so narrow, the way was so hard, the heart is so deceitful. What a contrast with faithful pastor Spurgeon to his flock in London. He says, among you, over whom it is my calling to preside, I know that there are false professors, lovers of the world rather than lovers of God. And though I cannot remove you any more than farmers removing tares from the wheat, yet I sigh over you. And you are my daily cross and burden. I know we as pastors and elders can sure relate to that. Oh, he says, that God would convert you and make you true to your professions or else remove you from the church which you so greatly grieve and weaken. It's terrifying. I've had people who appear to be false converts with little or no fruit and a trail of sin and immorality say to me, well, pastor, don't send me away to a dead church because I like to be around alive people. I know spouses who would happily come to church with their saved spouse because they get a better wife or a better husband out of the deal. What do you want, to take them to a dead church? But they're not saved. They just like the fact that they might have a saved spouse. And so they tag along, tie around the neck, living a lie. Let's read our passage, Matthew 7. Please stand as we hear the word of the Lord. From verse 24, follow as I read. Therefore, Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Oh Lord, rightly do we love our unity in the faith. We fight for it in many ways and right ought to defend it for those who are repentant, your truth does unify us in a bond of love. But for the unrepentant, your truth divides. And week after week, we have seen Jesus putting a fork in the road, separating, dividing. The one who came not to bring peace, but at times and in ways like this to bring a sword. Humble our hearts, teach us, we pray. Assure the true believers, expose false believers. Do your saving and judging work for your glory. Build your church, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Look at how the text begins. Always important to notice, verse 24, therefore. In other words, Jesus is saying, in light of all that I have just taught you, three chapters about entering God's kingdom, about proving your salvation, not earning it, not achieving it, but showing it through real 
obedience. A, a superior righteousness. Remember the theme verse for the whole Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 20. Unlike the external, outward, superficial, shallow righteousness of the Pharisees, you must have a superior, regenerate, internal, transforming righteousness if ever you're to enter the kingdom of heaven. So in other words, Jesus is saying, therefore, based on all I've said about true conversion, here's one final picture to make it stick. One last contrast to leave ringing in your ears. And beloved, our outline this morning is going to be two separate sections, two separate lists. We're going to look at some comparisons and then some contrasts. In fact, four comparisons and then uh, a kind of four contrasts, you could say, between the wise and the foolish builder, what the text is all about. So that you will be wise and not foolish in building your life for eternity. And you'll look back on the shores of glory one day, is my prayer, and say, praise God that I built on the rock and not on the sand, that I built wisely and not foolishly. Here's how you can ensure. Let's look, first of all, at four comparisons, and then we'll come to the contrasts. Comparisons between the wise and the foolish builder. Number one, both of them hear Jesus' word. Notice verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine. Verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine. In other words, all that I've commanded you in this sermon, you have heard it said, but I say to you. You understand the implication here, by the way. Jesus doesn't even say these words of my father, though, though that is true. No, he puts it much more strongly. These words of mine. He is declaring his deity, putting his own words on par with God's words, right? As no less divine and authoritative. It's as if Jesus is saying, when I lay down my law, it is equal to God's law. Mount Sinai and Sermon on the Mount, the same, if not even more authoritative in light of his coming cross and empty tomb and pouring out of his spirit at Pentecost and the new covenant. No wonder they react as they do, as we'll see at the end, stunned by this God-man standing before them. Beloved, don't miss this. One last time, I remind you, he's not talking about false religions, those who've never heard the gospel, those who are Muslims and Hindus. Yes, the Bible is clear. They cannot be saved without Jesus Christ. No, that is not his point here. Jesus is warning Bible people, evangelized, Christianized, churchgoers who know the Jesus lingo, but they don't know Jesus. On the same theme, once more, of the damning delusion of false assurance. Both these builders heard the words of Christ. Same opportunities, similar exposure, same kinds of spiritual privileges. They liked the same sermons. They downloaded the same preachers. They watched the same YouTube sermons. They went to the same conferences. They attended the same churches. They read the same books. They liked the same theology. They said amen at the same points in the sermon. <laughs> they said hallelujah at the same time. They sang the same songs. The problem with the house built on sand that's about to be destroyed was not any doctrinal error. It wasn't any theological heresy. It wasn't any false teaching. There was no lack of Bible knowledge. These damned souls did not reject the gospel. They did not deny Christ. They were seated on the front row, headed for the lake of fire. Second comparison. They hear Jesus' word. Second, they both build their house. They're both busy building. As one writer puts it, every ambition a man cherishes, every thought he conceives, every word he speaks, every deed he performs, as is, as it were, a building block. Gradually, gradually, the structure of his life rises up and up. And, and more specifically, notice, friends, both these builders appear to be doing religious kingdom work, involved in the cause of Christ, wearing his label, claiming to be his followers, flying the Jesus flag, Remember, some of them are false prophets, verse 15. They wear a good sheep disguise. Lord, Lord, look what we've done in your name. 
both are building. Don't you see? They've got their tools out. They've made their plans. They've laid out the blueprints. They've saved up their money. They've done the spreadsheets. They have checked their accounts. They've hired their workers. They have staffed their positions. They are managing the project quite effectively and with apparent success. They've laid the slab, perhaps. They've, they've raised the structure. They're stacking the bricks. There they go, busy with the project. Shining Christians, wonderful religious people, builders for Jesus, leaders in the community, speaking on God's behalf, outwardly righteous, moral, devout, pious, committed, and unconverted. A third comparison. Not only they hear Jesus' word, they build their house, but both of them, their houses look Christian on the surface. Both houses look Christian. Please read this parable in context, not like typical preachers who parachute into this cute little story and strip it out of its own context. It is very unlikely that Jesus is speaking with comedy or in a sarcastic or a comical way. He could not be more deadly serious. He's not talking about some outright idiot, an absolute moron who takes his own hard-earned wealth and says, hmm, how can I throw it all away? Let's find a really sandy, rubbish, ridiculous spot where my building can be destroyed as quick as possible and all my money go down the drain. Who wants to join me? That cannot be what Jesus is saying here. In the context, he's warned us, the gate is wide. Everyone wants to go there. They think it leads to life. Nobody would get on the road if it said eternal destruction, lake of fire, sign up now. No, heaven is promised. Where are the sheep's disguise? Lord, Lord, look what we've done in your name. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men. The whole point of this sermon, a rebuke to the Pharisees in particular. They were renowned for their self-righteousness, famous for their Bible knowledge, heroic with their religious favor, super involved in ministry. And Jesus seems to be suggesting here with this comparison between the wise and the foolish builders that there is a season of calm and safety before the storm clouds appear on the horizon. Smooth sailing, it seems. Unclouded sky, trouble free, traveling with the Lord, building for Jesus, fair weather friends of the Lord. All is well, peace, peace, when there is no peace. What, what, do you think there's a sign in front of the foolish house that, or, or some painting on the side of the house that says, foolish builder, doomed building? No. It's shining lights. It's Bible verses. It's big theology books. Oh, the human heart is much more deceitful than to think that this is something that would be obvious at first. The nature of sin is far more blinding. The character of Satan far more crafty. Beloved, if you had gone up to the foolish builder and you asked him, how do you feel, sir, about your great project? Uh, how's it going? Tell us about your skills and your, your house. I guarantee you he would say something along the lines of, thank you for asking. We are making swimming progress. I feel great. I'm a Christian after all. God has blessed the work of my hands. He saved me. He's made me wise to build this impressive edifice, a monument to my expertise in how to live life properly. You see, at this stage, before the storm hits, few, if any, can tell the difference. Not the builders, not the observers. No one smells a rat. No one detects a flaw. No one sniffs a problem until Number four, the fourth comparison. Not only both hear Jesus' word, both build their house, both houses look Christian on the surface. Number four, both are judged. Both are judged. Identical language is repeated verbatim here. Verse 25, and the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and slammed against that house. Verse 27, and the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and slammed against that house. 
And we thought the recent storms and destruction in Natal, and the devastation and loss of hundreds of lives was bad. We've seen nothing compared to what's coming. Torrential downpour. It's hard for us in our days of climate prediction and weather technology to realize the extent of vulnerable ancient life uh, to a sudden storm like this in the Mediterranean in particular. Cloudburst upon cloudburst in a dry riverbed that could not soak up much of the moisture at all. And within moments, a slow, shallow, quiet little brook would become this deep, rushing river and this fast and furious current leveling everything in its path, swallowing up all that precedes it, leaving destruction in its wake. You ask Tim, because we've all heard preachers going in different directions at this point on this story, this parable. Is the awful storm, is it the trials of life or is it judgment day? Answer, Jesus doesn't say. If it was that important, I think he would have told us. It might be both. They have a lot in common after all. The point here is not when it happens, but what it reveals. Whatever storm this is, it's a final test. It's an ultimate trial. It is your moment of truth, Christian, professing believer, exposing what had been hidden, perhaps for a very long time, beneath the surface, revealing each house's foundation, showing if your faith is genuine or not. (laughs) It doesn't matter whether you have true or false religion. One day, everyone will know, and God will make it clear, guaranteed. Sometimes in this life, definitely in the next. Unmasking the hypocrites, peeling back the curtain, lifting the veil, proving who is a pretender or not. We know this, don't we? Even in this life, we see. I remember with COVID, for example, you'd see two people, both claimed to be believers. They faced almost the exact same condition. And you'd see such just contrasting responses. Our true theology comes out. The real condition of our heart is exposed under the furnace, in the heat of the purifying fires. And here we have a picture of devastating loss, catastrophic crisis that shows where you stand, displays what you truly believe. But I do believe, and I am convinced, that the language of Jesus is mainly and fully and finally pointing to Judgment Day, the final exam, the biggest of all life's trials and tests. That's the context, remember? Verse 22, last time, many will say to me, on that day. Where does the broad road with the wide gate lead to? Verse 13, destruction, everlasting ruin, eternal destruction. Verse 19, where does the bad tree with the bad fruit get cut down and thrown into the? That's right, verse 19, the fire. Verse 23, what will be the words that they hear? Depart from me. The most traumatic of all storms that a soul could ever face. Therefore, verse 24, therefore. So it's on the heels of a judgment focus. Remember the wise and foolish virgins in our Lord's other parable in Matthew 25, based on whether they were ready or not for the midnight cry when the bridegroom returns. And a picture of our Lord's return, Jesus' second coming. Will we be wise with our lamps lit, with oil ready, or foolish, caught, exposed, unprepared? And often, this image of a coming storm, of a flood and a fury in the Old Testament is often pointing to the wrath of God and to judgment day and the day of the Lord. I mean, where do we start? multiple times in the book of Jeremiah, the book of Isaiah, the book of Ezekiel, and the Psalms. God's storm of righteous fury and angry wrath against his enemies, destroying all his foes. Friends, Hebrews 9, 27, what does it say? It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, to face the judgment. The appointment is set. The books are closed. The date has already been fixed in the diary 
and no peeking is allowed. You and I don't get to see when that day will be, but it is sure, it is certain, it is coming. Are you ready? Will you stand? Are you built on the rock, firm in Christ alone, ready to stand? Judgment day for the believer is not a threat. It's a joy. It's a triumph. It's vindication. It's expectation. We eagerly await it. Maranatha, our Lord, come. Not so for those built on the sand. Four comparisons. They hear his word. They build their house. They look Christian, and they are judged. Do you see them, friends, side by side, Mr. True Believer and Mr. False Believer, Mrs. Real Christian and Mrs. Fake Christian, immediate neighbors, sometimes it's like twins or, 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 or close cousins, they're sitting in the same church pews, they're attending the same small group, they, it's like they share the same hymnal, you could say they walked the aisle together, they prayed the prayer, they went through the motions, they, they, they stayed away from all those other false religions, they're, they're outwardly moral, they, they don't do worldly things, they, they look pure and holy, but one is unconverted. And perhaps nobody knows, nobody sees, nobody can tell until the storm. The same storm hits both their homes and becomes a great divide and a literal watershed moment. Oh, that we would learn the lesson of these four comparisons, these external similarities between the wise and the foolish builder. These outward resemblances ought to alert and alarm us, uh, startle us and awaken us, if need be, haunt us so that we will expect a bumpy ride in church history, that there'll be many tares among the wheat and many hypocrites in the church, so that we will be sober once more in this chapter to the dreadful danger of false assurance, to the demonic deception and the satanic subtlety that misleads millions. Friends, we have to rip off our rose-colored glasses, these spectacles of niceness, these... uh, courtesy lenses of of, of good manners today that refuse to face this alarming fact. In every church, there is a Judas. In every pew, there is a Demas. In every home group, there is a Diotrephes. Sooner or later. And Jesus prepared us for this. Also to call us to examine ourselves, to see if we are truly in the faith as we're commanded to do in 1 Corinthians 11 and 2 Corinthians 13. If we find that we are in the faith, we rejoice and we persevere to the end. By the grace of God, I am what I am. If we find that we are not, we repent and believe. Today, today's the day of your salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Scripture tells us, and now we come to four contrasts. From four comparisons, we look at four contrasts also between the wise and the foolish builder so that you will be wise and not foolish with eternally damning and disastrous consequences. But I need to tell you, it's really four contrasts describing and explaining one basic difference, one fundamental distinction here. What foundation did they build upon? Are you built on the rock? Are you built on sand? It strikes me. We all, I hope, I praise God for scripture songs. We teach them to our children eagerly. And we grew up with this song, didn't we? But I'm not sure. I don't remember any part of the song that drives home the main point, which is the one word. The wise builder acts on the words of Jesus. The foolish builder, verse 26, if you remember one word, three letters, red font, capital letters, underlined and highlighted in bold print, it's verse 26. The foolish builder is foolish because he does not, not, N-O-T, act. He doesn't do. He just hears. So we know the song, right? Wise man built his house upon the rock, house upon the rock, house upon the rock, right? The rains came down and the floods came up. And then the the house on the rock stood firm. And remember the other one? And the house on the sand went splat. But but what's the point of this message? May, May it not be lost on us. It's a graphic picture. The wise builder. It's a beautiful story. 
He faces this deadly torrent of water. And then you add these fierce gale force winds described here in verse 25. Pounding and pummeling and beating on his house with blow after blow. It's sure to fall. Everyone says that house is a write-off. And yet verse 25 concludes it had been founded on the rock. Verse 24 told us the same. He's wise because he built his house on the rock. Swirling waters, couldn't shake it. Battering winds would not level it. Unrelenting abuse of the storm would not succeed. All failed to bring the house down. Still it stood, firm in place, resisting all the onslaught, braving the cloudbursts, defying the fury of the elements, staring Mother Nature, as it were, straight in the eye, with a flint face, mocking her rage, all for one reason, built on the rock. Let me give you four contrasts here. First of all, the wise outlast the foolish. The wise outlast the foolish. Have you ever noticed throughout the Bible, the righteous endure catastrophes that destroy the wicked? I repeat, the righteous endure catastrophes that destroy the wicked. How about Lot? In contrast to the homosexual and perverse and immoral sodomites where fire and brimstone rained down upon them. How about Goshen where the Israelites were in Egypt and the plagues did not strike them. Not to mention then the Passover lamb rescuing them from the angel of death and the Red Sea parting and then plunging and flooding Pharaoh and his armies. The righteous endure catastrophes that destroy the wicked. David versus King Saul, that we've been learning on Sunday nights. There's tribulation saints in the end times. Listen to these three verses from Proverbs. I'd never read them before in light of Jesus' story about the wise and foolish builder. This is striking. Proverbs 10, verse 25. When the whirlwind passes, the wicked are no more, but the righteous are secure forever. Built on the rock. Proverbs 12, verse 7. How's this? The wicked are overthrown and perish but the house of the righteous will stand. I wonder if Jesus didn't have these Proverbs in mind when he taught this parable. One more, Proverbs 14, verse 11. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will stand. Built on the rock. Beloved, isn't this also why we don't envy the prosperity of the wicked? It's why the Psalms warn us against that, especially the two that are so memorable, Psalm 37 and Psalm 73. God's remedy, his cure for every time you and I are tempted to admire the extremely wealthy or to covet or envy those unbelievers who seem to have it all. They live it up with painless, trouble-free, uh, unstressed lives. Oh, must be nice. No. Psalm 37, fret not because of evildoers. Be not envious because of wrongdoers, for they will fade soon like the grass and wither like the green herb. Psalm 37, truly, Lord, you set them in slippery places and make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. As I've told you before, you can get these cross-references from me later if you wish. The Lord is saying, look at today in light of eternity. See this day in light of that day, judgment day. No matter how outwardly impressive and even religious and prosperous, if they are not truly saved, they're built on the sand, not on the rock, and one day it will be obvious to all. A terrible storm is coming. Second contrast. Not only the wise outlast the foolish, but secondly, the wise prepare for the future. Unlike the foolish, the wise prepare for the future. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and... Finish the sentence. Be wise. Right? Proverbs 6. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest because she was ready. Proverbs 20, verse 4. In contrast, the sluggard does not plow in autumn. He will seek at harvest and have nothing. How much more in light of eternity? Wise people prepare. Fools are caught unprepared. Only living for the present. They hate delayed gratification. They want it all. They want it now, right now. 
And so this foolish builder here, denying the judgment that was coming. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. zippity doo da, zippity day. It's going to be a wonderful day. Always bright, always sunny, happily ever after. I'll ride off into the sunset. No answer for my hypocrisy. No giving an account at last. But the word wise here in verse 24, a wise man is the Greek word for sensible or insightful because they are prepared. They didn't procrastinate. They're not unready. They're not caught by surprise like the foolish virgins in the other parable from Jesus. Their lamp is lit. They're, they have plenty of oil. They're ready for their master's return. They planned well. They have foresight. They know danger is coming. They've provided for the future. They don't wait for others to do it for them. The wise versus the foolish builder. One more, Proverb 21, verse 5. Proverbs 21, 5. The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. Fools are always in a rush, right? As we'll see in a moment further. But the wise prepare. If that's true in daily life, how much more in eternal destiny? The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I shall not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. The believer is ready and sure and secure. Number three, not only the wise outlast the foolish, the wise prepare for the future, unlike the foolish, but third, contrast here, the rock is an obedient faith. The rock is an obedient faith. Built his house on the rock. Founded it on the rock. Verse 24, verse 25. Safe, secure location. Solid, immovable foundation. Sounds like the Psalms, doesn't it? Often we read, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Oh God, my everlasting rock, unchanging, eternal. You will set me high upon a rock. My head will be lifted up above my enemies. But you ask Tim, what is this bedrock? This is the million rand question in this text here upon which everything hinges, around which everything revolves. And I bring you back to that one little word with three letters that starts with an N and ends with a T and it has an O in the middle. <laughs> Verse 26. The foolish builder hears these words of mine and does not... I repeat, does not, one more time, does not act on them. Literally in the original, doesn't do them. But the wise builder, in verse 24, hears these words and acts on them. The bedrock, I need to tell you, I hope this doesn't burst your bubble or spoil your day from what you might have been told in Sunday school, the rock is not Jesus in this passage that's a great point and a bad text. <laughs> that is a biblical truth in the wrong location. <laughs> Many other scriptures we could turn to. Amen, amen. Jesus, our cornerstone. Jesus, our anchor. Jesus, our solid rock. Let's sing it tonight. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen, wrong passage. Leave it to our modern Arminian, man-centered age of small God theology and a low view of sin and a antinomian, anti-law, hyper-grace, easy believism, leave it to our age to take any passage about sanctification and reframe it as justification because we love talking about justification and we get very uncomfortable in the realm of sanctification. And this passage is about sanctification. What do we say in our declaration of faith with the Protestant reformers? How often have we said this? We are justified by faith alone and the faith that justifies is never alone but is accompanied by good works. It will bear fruit. And the rock here clearly is your obedience. Christian adherence to the commands of the king. 
not Jesus. It's, yes, it's closely related, as we'll see, but it is my walk in submission to the Lord Jesus, my life of following his commands, living in his kingdom, under his kingship, beneath his lordship. But it cannot mean saving myself. It's not building my life on my words or your words. It's Christ's words. And his first word is repent and believe the gospel and stop trusting yourself and renounce your self-righteousness and realize you can't, your works can't save you and throw yourself completely and utterly, totally on Jesus Christ. That's the first command of the gospel. Repent, believe. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Repent, believe. But the emphasis here is do we act like the wise builder or not act? Notice there in verse 24, it's present tense, ongoing, continual. It isn't sinless perfection, but neither is it an empty profession. It is a progressive sanctification, actual obedience, a transformed pattern of life, a new lifestyle, daily, not infrequently, actively, not passively. Submitting to God's word, a superior, a sincere righteousness from within as a real citizen of Christ's kingdom. The whole message of scripture, the whole message of the New Testament is that our destination as children of God, the, the goal, goal of the Christian life is Christ-like holiness. But we never arrive at it. God forbid if you ever think you have arrived. That's a, that's a sure sign that you haven't. <laughs> It's not about perfection, it's about direction of my life. Actual progress, however faltering, in holiness. An older writer puts it well. The whole drift and movement of this long discourse has carried us forward with it to one most weighty practical conclusion of the whole Sermon on the Mount, that after all, the only one who is a Christian, a true convert, a real believer, is the one who does what Christ bids him. He obeys the king. This is not complicated. <laughs> I think the problem is that it's so clear. Luke chapter six adds that the wise man dug down deep on the solid foundation. And we're back to the beginning of the sermon. The Beatitudes, the hard work of true repentance. Yes, it is empowered by sovereign grace and the effectual calling and the regenerating work of God's spirit. But nonetheless, the command is strive to enter the narrow gate. Ask, seek, knock. Take hold of eternal life. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Blessed are those who mourn, who are poor in spirit, who uh, crave and hunger and thirst for righteousness and so forth. It's not passive, it's active. Salvation's not sluggish, it's serious, it's not relaxed, it's intense. It's not once saved, always saved. Where did that come from? I grew up with that in Southern Baptist churches. That is not what scripture teaches. The Bible doesn't say once saved, always saved. The Bible says if saved, always saved. Important difference. Let's get back to our biblical and Protestant roots. I'll give you examples. John chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus says this to many who believed in him. And so he turns to the Jews who had believed in him. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Hebrews 3, verse 14. For we have come to share in Christ. We know we are saved. If indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Getting saved, unconditional. Knowing you're saved, Conditional. Conditional. Colossians 1. And you who once were alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, now he has reconciled in his body of flesh by his death to present you holy and blameless above reproach. You know you're saved, Paul says, Colossians 1. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, built on the rock. There is a doctrine that has been utterly lost and almost disappeared from the modern Christian church. It used to be standard fare and or normal language amongst Protestant believers. It goes like this, saved by grace, judged by works. Why has that vanished? In an overreaction to Rome, we have dove into Pelagian puke. And we're drowning in lawless, easy believism 
with no fruit and no changed lives and a bunch of people who think they're going to heaven about to face a terribly rude awakening when they meet the judge. Saved by grace, judged by works. Read the whole book of James. Read James 1, read James 2. Go back to my sermons on Romans chapter 2. The, largely the whole chapter, the whole witness of scripture, the white robes and revelation of the deeds of the righteous, the sheep and goat judgment. Jesus says that the sheep and goats will be separated based on what you did or didn't do. We are utterly saved, entirely by sovereign grace alone, through faith only in Christ's perfect person, his finished work al alone on the cross. But that is not how we will be finally judged on the last day in the dock. We get saved and we are sustained by grace alone, but we prove we are saved by our fruit before God and men, saved by grace, judged by works. I always say, what does this true faith look like? The whole Sermon on the Mount, the Lord has given us three whole chapters of a detailed, clear, unmistakable description. Let's hurry on to our fourth and final contrast here, the sand. We've seen the wise outlast the foolish, the wise prepare for the future, the rock is an obedient faith, and the fourth, the sand is a disobedient, shallow faith. Disobedient Shallow faith. Some think that maybe even the foolish builder had some extra cash because he didn't waste time digging slow and paying more for labor so he could throw up a fancier house quicker. Feet that hasten miss the way, Proverbs warns us. Fools love haste. They want it done quickly. They're impatient. They want instant gratification, quick results. It sounds like most of evangelism in Christianity today. No time to explain things deeply. No time to instruct people in repentance. No time for thorough uh, teaching on the doctrine of sin or the law of God or the Ten Commandments or the Beatitudes or divine judgment or eternal hell. No, it's, it's shortcut evangelism. It's quickie conversions. It's lightweight professions. It's uh, muck baptisms in the age of muck church with microwave sermons and takeaway religion and drive through worship that produces a bunch of shallow believers and false converts. Spurgeon bemoaned this. He says, lack of depth, want of sincerity, want of reality and religion. This is the, the, the lack of our times, a, a want of an eye to God and religion, a lack of sincere dealing with one's own soul, neglect of using the lancet, another old, old word for the needle of God's law with our hearts, a neglect of a deep heart searching and heavy conviction over sin, a carelessness about living upon Christ alone. Oh, there's much reading and talking about Jesus, but not much of John chapter six, feeding upon his flesh, drinking of his blood. If Christ is not your everything, you might be unsaved. Spurgeon says these are the causes of tottering professions and baseless hopes, unfounded, ungrounded, false faith. Hearers but not doers, right? James chapter one, you look in the mirror and you forget and walk away, you fool. He's heard Jesus' words, but he refuses to build his life upon them. And so Jesus ends, verse 27, concludes this whole sermon with a traumatic scene. If this were on video, it would be unfit for public view. It would be too graphic and grotesque. Verse 27, look at the text. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great. Sounds like a big house. Great was its fall. He was the preacher, he was the pastor, he was an elder, he was a leader, he was the last person you expected. Before long, the deadly deed is done. The storm spent itself on this foolish home. The soil is weakened, the foundations eroded, the walls are loosened, the integrity of the whole structure is compromised. The strong winds give the final push and with a tremendous crash, the whole home collapses in on itself, crushing the human lives within, leaving only the angry floods to haul it away, washing out even the very gravel and sand upon which the shack was erected. 
The ruin is complete. The wreckage is strewn everywhere. A final tribute, a monument to a foolish builder and a failed project and a disobedient faith and a false convert. And the great white throne, Revelation 20, will tell the final tale. But even on that day, there will be these haunting echoes in the corridors of the judgment hall. Lord! Lord! And thundering back will be the terrifying voice, the wrath of the Lamb, declaring, depart from me. I never knew you. No wonder the chapter ends like it does. Look at their response. Verse 28, when Jesus finished these words, the crowds were amazed. The word here, awestruck, dumbfounded, astonished at his teaching. Why? Verse 29, for he's teaching them as one having authority, not as the scribes. The scribes quoted this rabbi and second-handed and borrowed from this and that authority. Jesus doesn't even say, thus says the Lord. He says, I say to you, these words of mine. And all they could ask is, who is this man? No one ever spoke as he spoke. Four comparisons, four contrasts presenting us with one choice. Will you, are you a wise or a foolish builder? I have to end with this. It's a story from one of our own church members a few years ago. Many of you remember our dear brother and youth leader for a number of years, David Payton. But what you may not be aware of is at his mother's funeral. Was she late 50s, early 60s? I mean, she was quite young and died quite suddenly of cancer. And David DeBrain at uh, NCBC did the funeral. And she, her last wish was that everyone, and I kept it, be handed this testimony of a life built on the rock after being built on the sand for a long time. She says this. I was just a teenager when I met Derek, Peyton, her husband. Early in our friendship, he made it clear to me that nothing serious could develop between us because I was not a Christian. With some deliberate yet subtle manipulative behavior, I persuaded him to give me a chance. If he wanted a Christian girl, that is what he would have. So began the path of a life of self-deception, self-righteousness, and external religiosity. In his youthful zeal and earnest desire for me to be born again, Derek fed me a diet of heavy Puritan writings. The very first book he gave me was entitled The Five Points of Calvinism. I devoured these books, she says, to please my husband with, to, with an academic interest as well in the content. It equipped me with an orthodoxy and a good foundation, but the truths never traveled the 18 inches from my head to my heart. I learned evangelical language. I could articulate a confession of faith. It was credible enough to deceive not only myself, but Derek and a wide circle of family and friends. Married in 1976, 30 odd happy years of family devotions. Oh, I could pray. Bringing up our boys in a moralistic way with a strong Christian ethic, a model stay-at-home wife, attending church, personal devotions as a duty to be performed and not a privilege to be enjoyed. Built on the sand. S until six years ago. This is at her funeral. Six years ago, she says, the Lord worked in the lives of our sons, David and Graham who were in their late teenage years. Their conversions were radical and I was challenged by the change I saw in their lives. You will know them by their fruits. They requested that we switch off the TV in our home and there was an eerie silence left, a void. So I began to read. I stood looking at our bookshelves one day and found an obscure Puritan book called The Almost Christian Discovered by Matthew Mead from the 1600s. It's based from Acts 26 where Agrippa says to Paul, you will almost persuade me to be a Christian. How far, she says, can a man go on the way to heaven and yet be but almost a Christian? This is what the book answered and it described me. I was shocked. She says, a man may have much knowledge and yet be but almost a Christian. A man may hate sin and yet be but almost a Christian. A man may be a member of a Christian church and yet but almost a Christian. A man may have great hopes of heaven and yet be but almost a Christian. A man may be very zealous in matters of religion, but almost a Christian. Much in prayer, but almost a Christian. All the external duties in worship, and yet almost a Christian, built on the sand. She says, and then I read these words of J.C. Ryle that shook my pharisaical world. 
All most Christians have many things about them which are right, good, praiseworthy in the sight of God. They're regular, moral. They're free from glaring outward sins. They keep up many decent and proper habits. They sit under our pulpits. They appear to love the preaching of the gospel. They are not offended at the truth in Jesus, however plainly it is spoken. No objection to religious company, religious books, religious talk. They agree to all that you say when you speak to them about their souls. And all this as well. But... However, there is no movement in the hearts of these people that even a microscope could detect. They're like those who stand still week after week, year after year, rolls over their heads, and they are just like they were, always the same, constant attendance, doing the things of religion, wishing, hoping, talking about religion, and nothing more. No progress, no forward movement, no life, no heart, no reality. Their soul is at a deadlock, and it is sadly wrong. They're built on the sand. She says in closing, this is what she went and handed out at her funeral. This, capital letters at this point, this was me. I wasted my life. How was I to tell my family I'd been a fake for more than 30 years? My pride, my reputation took a serious knock, but I was encouraged to face the truth of my condition by similar testimonies. I heard about the wife of Martin Lloyd-Jones during his pastoral ministry, the wife of Paul Washer and others. And so began the path of life. The Holy Spirit opened my eyes. I saw I had faith in a system of beliefs rather than the person of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. He moved the truth from my head to my heart and I mourned and continue to mourn over my sinfulness. Blessed are those who mourn. I battle still with old patterns and habits. I battle with a memory, not what it used to be. I distrust myself and my motives. I'm wary of the evangelical cliches, so easy to utter, but I cannot live in the past. I must press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then she ends with a whole other page, what she believes about who Jesus is and his finished work on the cross and the work of his spirit and his kingdom in her life. Built on the rock. Let's bow our heads as we pray. My God, I mark with fear how many hopes decay and like the foolish builder's house fall in the trial day. Perhaps amid this throng there is a soul you espy whose towering hopes are built on sand. I ask, Lord, is it I? A thousand doubts arise, I bring them all to thee. Am I unconsciously deceived? Lord, search my heart and see. Oh, teach me deep to dig down to the solid rock that when tornadoes round me sweep, my house may bear the shock. Oh, Father, we are so thankful that you have made most clear the things are, that are most urgent and of eternal significance and the most grave consequences. Thank you that we are not left in doubt to know whether our faith is grounded or not, whether we are building on the rock or the sand. Thank you that for the true born-again child of God, the evidence of your spirit will bring fruit. The work of faith will be obedient. However faltering, however failing, it will be unmistakable. And you, by your grace, the strength you supply, not in our own strength, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit, Lord, we can not only be hearers, but doers of the word. Working out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing it is you who work within us to will and to do according to your good pleasure. If there are any here in this room who are indeed unconverted or fear that they might be, we pray, O oh Lord, they would truly and fully, aggressively and comprehensively repent and forsake all known sins sins of omission, sins of commission, in light of your holy law, and flee to the cross, run for refuge in the bleeding wounds of Jesus and his finished work, and the, throw themselves upon your mercy, the person of our Redeemer and the great Savior, the Lord Jesus. In his gracious name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm.